Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for attending my presentation here. I'm going to discuss determination methods needed for cyclic behavior of railroad loadings. My name is Stephen Dick. I am a research engineer at Purdue University. Uh, I worked 39 years in the railroad industry prior to that, so I'm I'm uh, I'm an old hand at this uh, in some respects. But uh, I want to talk about uh, fatigue cycling and how we determine the cycles. That's the biggest issue we have in, in railroad bridge analysis. The, the question always is, how many cycles do we have? The question comes up often, how many cycles do I count? And the answer invariably is, it depends. And that's the issue. It depends on some conditions. Our concerns, many of our railroad bridges are steel bridges, and most of these steel railroad bridges are old. Approximately 75% of them are 75 years old or older. Uh, and there's some other stats that are out there that, that uh, are even a little scarier in some respects. Uh, the riveted deck girder is the predominant type. And uh, with that, they have a fatigue cycle threshold of only six KSI. So we have to be very careful in our loadings. Uh, also, because there are so many, uh, so many different bridges and, and ages of the bridges, we have a ton of different design levels, so there's a, there's a possibility it was designed for uh, older conditions and uh, not using not using the modern design criteria that we have now. The other issue is that highway bridge fatigue analysis is fairly straightforward with a simple three axle truck. We don't have that. We uh, railroad bridge fatigue analysis relies currently on the Cooper E load stresses. Unfortunately, the Cooper E load is not a representative load for railway cars and how they load the bridge. So that's where we need guidance. And that's, uh, that's the kind of research that I am involved with. Uh, on purpose, railroad bridges are governed by deflection criteria. So the moment of inertia actually governs the design. It's the, actually the very first thing you want to check. Uh, we still use allowable stress design. We are probably the only set of recommendations still left uh, for anything major that uses allowable stress. But the design load has been consistent since Cooper be became the loading in 1906. And, you know, it is the same loading pattern, but it is scalable. And that was always the good thing about the Cooper load was that it was very scalable. Uh, impacts have also changed, but then allowable stresses have also increased as well. So, but all in all, we're still governed by moment of inertia. So that allows for, for direct comparisons of things. Uh, since the loads and the allowable stresses and consistent deflection criteria are applied, then the design process should also be consistent. The section properties for any design from one railroad will be close to those of another railroad with the same parameters. And uh, actually that does occur. And then our knowledge of fatigue uh, detail capacity is, is documented. We are very similar to the, to the, uh, to the highway provisions. These are the different uh, Cooper load levels. The, the chapter 15 steel bridge design criteria was first introduced in 1906. And then uh, it has been changed through the years. Uh, the, the load level went up. The impact equations have changed considerably through the years. Uh, and now, from since 1968, rolling impact became the primary impact equation versus the hammer blow that was used previously for steam locomotives. So there's our there's our, our design load. We still use this design load, the, the Cooper E80 loading. Uh, the one issue about it that it makes it not good for fatigue analysis is that our largest axle spacing is only nine feet, and that is that is uh, woefully short compared to what we're using in actual service. Uh, we also introduced uh, in the 90s the alternate load, and this, this load replicates the, uh, the couplings at the ends of cars, and, it, and we have a higher axle load simply to take care of the increases in axle loads that occurred over the years. And all in all, when you calculate the section modulus properties needed for, for the various, those five different design criteria, you notice that uh, the blue line on the bottom, E40, 1906, you would expect that to be at the bottom. But uh, the interesting thing is, is that if you look, the, the next highest capacity is actually the current E80 design levels that we are using now. And the, the, the largest section is actually created by the E60 design uh, using 1920 impact. Uh, down at shorter levels, the E72 levels are also right in the same, same area. But the interesting thing is, is that our largest sections were actually developed using using 1920 criteria. 
including the design load. Now, this is what our freight cars actually look like. Uh, if anyone has ever, you know, glanced at, at trains, you know, you know what I'm talking about. The little blue circles there at the bottom, those are the dimensions that we worry about as far as bridge analysis is concerned. What is the spacing of the axles throughout the train? Uh, if you look at actual cars, uh, these are these are typical hopper cars, an open hopper uh, for coal trains, which which everyone has probably seen. And then you've got the covered hoppers. The covered hopper is approximately one third of the of the entire rail rail car fleet. There's over five hundred thousand of these of, of those running around, and they have all kinds of dimensions. And the axle loads are up to seventy one and a half thousand pounds on on these now as and that's that's allowable for unrestricted running the, then we have our intermodal uh, trains uh, the one on the left is an articulated uh, container platform and those uh, two axles there in the middle can get up to 78,750 pounds which is the 315,000 pound truck or the 125 ton truck that they talk about the other thing you notice on the other platform the TOFC COFC platform is look at the length of the axle spacings between the trucks on that car. That's actually just uh, over 60 feet uh, on that particular car. So the anticipated number of cycles are not well defined, but we can break down the, the trains into three different types. We have the unit train, which is like a coal train. All the cars are identical. They all weigh the, uh, weigh the same. We have the articulated trains, which is our intermodal trains. And there's actually what you have is two different loading patterns. Uh, on the ends, you have a four axle loading pattern, and in the middle, you have a two axle loading pattern. So then it becomes a matter of keeping up with your accounting, you know, a portion of the number of cycles properly. Then you have a mixed train, which is just all kinds of car types. You don't know whether they're loaded or empty. They may be partially loaded, all this. What, be, what it becomes critical is that if you're going to do fatigue analysis for railroad bridges, you have to look at the time histories to figure out what's going on. So let's go back to our diagram. If we want to look at very short spans, uh, I've circled one of the trucks there in with the red, red circle. Let's say we have a span length that's actually shorter than the distance between those two trucks. Uh, and this is actually common for transverse floor beam floors on, on through girders. What happens is, is that this is what your time history looks like. It's a whole series of spikes. So you get a spike for every axle that, that crosses over. Six. Uh, six spikes for each locomotive, and then you've got four spikes for each car. So basically, you you know, just count up your axles and, they, and the weights, and you can do your, you can do your uh, uh, root mean cube calculations from there. That's fairly simple. But once you get beyond there, once let's say we load up here to the entire four axles that appear like in the alternate loading system, what happens is, is that under that same loading, it, it becomes a different set of peaks. And so you've only got one large peak per car, essentially, and those per locomotive. And that is that is basically what it looks at. So you have to actually account for groups of axles instead of just accounting for number of axles. You end up having to, and, and then, then you're talking about counting the number of cars that you have to look at for the number of cycles. Then what happens is, is that if we get beyond this dimension S sub I, uh, what happens is, is that the load is always present on the bridge, so the time history starts to look, and you see that you have a have a minimum moment at the bottom, but you have not reached back to full, just dead load without any live load present at all. So then you have to take into account, is that cycle there, that variational cycle, uh, the, what I call a range cycle, is that actually large enough to actually create a cycle that needs to be counted? Um, that it goes back for railroading you need to remember one thing with structural analysis for every maximum moment there is a minimum moment sometimes it is zero sometimes it is not so that's what you have to account for then you get to very long spans you can just tell by inspection that there's no way that, that variation in light load moment is actually going to create one so now you've just got one cycle per train in this condition so what you have to do with, with railroad trains is basically you're doing some analysis on just what kind of cycles are. Then you go to the mixed train, and then you are in a completely stochastic process. And for this, you basically need a computer, computer program to crunch through this, crunch the axle loads and the spacings, determine the stresses, and then do rain flow counting on this to determine the number of cycles.
Okay, so in summary, any fatigue model for railroad trains must include the type of train and the types of equipment used in that train. Uh, span length is critical in the model development and multiple models are needed since, since distinct train types are in use. We can't simply rely on something uh, like the highway people can rely on with just a, uh, a single truck. There, it needs to be, it needs to have something available for the different operating conditions. Thank you very much. Um, I hope this stirred some interest and, uh, and I appreciate any questions you may have after uh, when, the, when the time comes. Thank you very much.